Nice. And then I'll put, all right. So section or session one, chapter 13, number 15, a nice 102 question for me. All right. How'd the uh, exam go for you? Oh, that's uh, that's what I emailed you about. I wanted to talk to you about uh, strategies oh, yeah. to to do some do better in in other words, or you know what to do from now. Because uh, okay. I just I don't know if this the the online thing might not be the one for me, but we'll we'll see. I I want to talk about it in, in yeah. detail okay. and private, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then and and uh, you're the one I responded and said, hey, let me uh, go ahead and get a chance to grade these, and then let's talk more. Is that, is that you? Uh, well, but if not, let me say that. Um, okay. Say, okay. Yeah. Uh, what you, you said it was, out. if you can ask it over email, sure. And I was like, well, yeah. Um, but uh, well, yeah. and then I said, pretty much tomorrow works for me. So, so I'm here, and I do actually have a question about it, which is good because it works out. But I will also like to talk to you in more private. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Great. All right. So let me uh, let me get to your uh, question, and I will do that first by finding the question let's see 102 all right let's scroll down here and get to number chapter uh, 13 and then let's go down to the exercises okay here are the exercises and then number uh 15 ah a really good question it's uh more of a well i'm gonna say it was more conceptual but not really it's it's actually both uh, well let me explain I think the best way to do that is to share my screen here. Uh, let me just to confirm, you're talking about 15 in the exercises, not 15 in the conceptual yeah. ones, right? Okay. Oh, uh, I, I hope I did. Okay, yeah, it, the one that says six grams of liquid X. You're good. Yep. Yeah, and I right, and I know it's it's uh, because it's in the exercises. It's uh, very tempting to think it's only mathematics and the calculation, but uh, not this one. Or it, it, it is once you understand conceptually the definition of specific heat. That, that's really what I wanted to say here. Um, and so let me keep going here to share my screen. And I'll connect the uh, camera up here, let it Bluetooth connect. There we go. Um, focus it. Oh, good. All right. So, uh, let me uh, do this way. I'm going I'm to start by saying what they're taking is some kind of material. They don't say what it is. They just say, take this as liquid. And they also say that you have six grams of uh, liquid X. And then, of course, they also say that it's at 35 degrees. And then they mix it with, and I know liquids actually kind of, you know, stir together, but then you just, for thinking purposes, let me just put it as a chunk right next to it and say, okay, here is um, material Y. Um, it is at a colder temperature uh, 20 degrees and it has a specific heat of one calorie per gram of HTL. Oh, my X here. Uh, liquid X has a specific heat of two calories per gram per each degree. And what I was getting at that was trying to say conceptually is what does this specific heat actually mean? And so when it says two calories per gram for each degree, it means that if you were to add or take away, okay, but add or take away two calories from one gram, it would change by one degree. No, it, it, that's the amount of energy. One gram needs to change by one degree. So since there's six calories here, I'm going to just kind of divide this into six boxes. Uh, those six boxes, I guess, would represent, or each box would represent, in my mind, one gram. 
The question goes on to say this, and here's where you got to be careful. It said, if each gram of liquid X were to give us two, right there, each gram is giving us two. That tells me right away that liquid X is going to drop by one degree. That's the meaning of specific heat. How much energy does it take for it to change, you know, by one degree? One gram, one degree. When somebody tells me the specific heat is two, or in this case, uh, my case, it's, it's one. We'll talk about that soon. But I would say then the change in temperature is a negative one degree Celsius for that, that That's just what those words mean right there. That's the part I was saying that the first part of this, you might think of it as more conceptual. Now, you could just do this mathematically. Um, you could have said something like this, MC delta T equals Q. Now, that's a formula that uh, I, I hope looks familiar to you. Uh, that's the one that connects the specific heat and the mass and the change in temperature. Uh, the only thing that maybe is a little hard about this one is this is talking about all of it. Um, I guess we could break it down to one gram uh, if you want. Uh, well, maybe I will. And so if I did math here, this would be one gram. Uh, the specific heat is given as the two calories per gram per degree. Uh, the change in temperature is what I would want to solve for. And then, of course, here's where you got to, you know, make sure you're kind of following the words in that equation. The Q, then, is they're saying it's a, it's a loss of two. And so this would be two calories. Uh, so, again, if you just run through the numbers here, grams cancels with grams, calories with calories, two with two. And so the change in temperature is minus one. So we even could have put a negative two because it lost it and got a negative for the change in the temperature. So either way, whether you wanted to do it mathematically or conceptually, and since it is an exercise, I, I guess I'm getting the uh, impression that the author probably wanted us to do this way where we did a, a calculation to do the exercise. That's usually what the exercises are about calculation. But he made the X one so easy because it was really conceptual. It was saying, hey, you're losing two calories, and the specific heat is two calories per gram for each degree. Now, the Y is a little bit harder. Uh, and so maybe I'll write that same equation, MC delta T equals Q. And again, we can think about one calorie, I'm sorry, one gram or Thing. Uh, maybe I'll do the whole thing because I don't know, that's just the way I think. Because if they told me that, and I'll draw a little picture here, two came out of each gram. And I'll make like six little arrowheads, and each arrowhead is losing two. That's, that's what they said. Every gram lost two. All right, so that would tell me that the amount of energy total gained by Y is 12, because there is two for every gram, and there are six grams. Okay, so that this number here has got to be 12. That's how much went into a liquid Y. Uh, now, they also told me the mass of liquid Y. I guess I forgot to write it here in the uh, diagram. But this is the three grams. Uh, the specific heat they gave me is one calorie per gram for each degree, and then I can do a delta T. So grams will cancel with grams, calories with calories. The three would come over here and divide by 12, so that would be four. So the change in temperature would be four. 
Of course, warming up and gaining. And then they just say, find the change in it. Well, I guess I'm done, the change is four. But the final temperature then would be 24 because it says it's starting. Oh, and maybe I should be cautious with that word final. I don't want to mislead you. Um, because it, it wouldn't be done. It would be done in terms of the question. The question just asked if this loss two, because that's what would happen first. This would lose two calories for every gram until so the whole thing would drop one degree. So the liquid X would drop from 35 down to 34 degrees. And in the meantime, liquid Y would warm up from 20 to 24. That says we're done with the problem, but I just can't help but go further on this problem because if you really mix these liquids, you still now have a hot liquid and a cold liquid, so they're not done. So the same thing would, would happen again. Uh, liquid X would start to lose some energy, and if it lost two calories for every gram, it would drop another one degree, and so it would drop to 33, which the same math would apply, and so liquid Y would go up to 28. Well, now they're still not at the same temperature, so that would happen yet again, and so this would drop down to 32, and this will rise up to 32, and now we would be Two liquid, same temperature, no more changing of energy. And so one, two, three times uh, we lost two calories per gram for each degree, and then these all gained and they need a final temperature of 32. Of course, if the question had just asked for the final temperature, well, we could have just you know done one solid calculation like that too. But that wasn't quite how that question was asked. Most of the questions do ask, what is the final temperature? So uh, you and many, many people asked me about this, this problem because I think because of that, it wasn't, it wasn't just, hey, what's the final temperature? This is kind of, hey, what is the temperature partway through the process? Hey, can professor, help? can I interrupt with something really quick? Sure, sure. Um, your audio sounds a little bit um, strange this morning. Oh. Okay. I um, wonder if I... Oh. It's fine now. I'm it's fine now? Any distortion anymore. Yeah. Weird. As soon as she said something, <laughs> it's... Now it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> now it That's sounds so good. weird. Okay. So it, it, was, it was really weird? Yeah, it was kind of just weird. <laughs> okay. It was happening okay. while you were moving your pen on the paper. Okay, is it doing it now? No, it? <laughs> no it's fine. <laughs> That's weird. Oh, good. I'm, I'm glad I said something. Just kidding. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, well, I'm glad you said something. And, and, and yeah, you guys have been here many times, so you know what it's, it, it should normally sound like. Uh, so thank you. But uh, I won't uh, restart or reboot anything if, uh, if it uh, has corrected no, itself. Fine. Okay. All right. I wonder if I was uh, further away. Uh, hmm. so I, maybe I should, probably, I, I probably should get closer to my laptop. Might be a little further away this time than before, but all right. Uh, uh, Rafael, do you have, do you have another uh, quick one or short one? Um, I don't get too many 102 people, and I uh, I, I, oh, sure. I don't want to put off the uh, 122 people too long. Um, okay, yeah, uh, 22, same page, 22. Okay. The one with the little difficulty triangle on it. Okay, number 22, same uh, page. Oh, yeah, and of course, remember that the triangle one means it's hard. Yeah. Oh, hey, mine's got an echo in it now. Do you guys, is, am I sound okay? Yeah, you're sounding fine. Okay, I have an echo from you. Oh. Oops. Hey, talk, Scott. Uh, is it me? 
No, 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 you're just fine. All right. Oh, that's weird. I'll try to reconnect my, my audio thing. Oh, yeah, well, no, it, 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 it's, it's not a problematic. And it's uh, better problem. now. Uh, no, it's about the same. <laughs> But uh, no, don't, yeah, don't, 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 don't stress about it. I, I, I can tell what you're saying. Plus, uh, I think I'm going to do most of the talking here. So yeah, I was going <laughs> to say you can do the talking. All right. So, all right. So chapter uh, 13, number 22. Yeah. And got the red triangle here. Um, and, and here's why it says how much heat is required to convert 400 grams of ice at negative five degrees into water. So this is a question about adding energy, but one of the things that's crucial for this problem is to understand that there's actually three steps we have to take. You cannot do this in one solid step. The reason why is there is going to be a calculation of heat for what I will call the warming of the ice because the ice is at zero degrees Celsius, I'm sorry, the ice is starting at negative five degrees Celsius, and when you warm it, it's gonna remain ice until you get to zero degrees. So that's gonna be my first calculation. Uh, my second calculation is what I will call melting the ice. This is that latent heat. This is the energy where you have to break the bonds, uh, this is the reason we call it the latent heat is because the temperature will not go up at this point. And it takes energy nonetheless to break the bonds, but that's where the energy is going. It's going to break the bonds. It is not going into making the water molecules go faster. And so the early scientists were a little confused by that. They were like, whoa, 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 I added energy and the temperature didn't go up because of course they added energy, but it wasn't showing up as kinetic energy. And temperature is kinetic energy. And then of course, once we melt it, now we have liquid water, but it's still at zero degrees. So now we've got to go from zero degrees up to five degrees. So I will call this then warming of the liquid. And so those are my uh, three steps. So why don't I start with the ice one first? I will then write M C delta T and maybe over the top of it put ice because we always use that that same equation M C delta T. That's the equation that gives us how much energy when we're changing its temperature. The other equation, the latent heat, is the part needed to melt it. Uh, this is the mass times the latent heat of either fusion or vaporization. We're not, we're not going from a, a liquid to a gas, so we don't have the latent heat of vaporization for this problem. But this is the latent heat of fusion when you go between the solid and the liquid. And then, of course, we'll have another MC delta T, because, again, now we are warming the liquid. Um, but it's a, it's a liquid now, so I, I, I don't want to incorporate it into the same equation. All right, so here would be those three steps. So the first one is the 400 grams, and then we need to know the specific heat of ice. And uh, it's listed there in the uh, chapter, uh, but ice is a half a calorie per gram per each degree. And let me point out, because we deal so much with liquid water, you might have memorized one for liquid water. And all that's true, this is not liquid water, this is ice. So I know it's still H2O, but, and so it's really tempting to put a one, but it's not a one. It's in a different uh, state and things are a little different. So it's only a half there. And then, of course, the change in temperature is five degrees because we're warming it from a negative five up to zero. So that'd be my first calculation. Now, my second calculation, calculator handy. My second uh, calculation is, again, the same mass. So there's the 400 grams. 
And how much does it take to melt or break the bond? So that's our latent heat of fusion. Again, uh, that's listed in the uh, table two. Uh, do you want me to go back and look at, let's see, which table is that? Uh, to give you a little better information, let me scroll through the book here. Uh, chapter 14, that'd be somewhere around here. Ah, so here's the specific heat, yeah, table one. And then, yeah, here's the latent heat, table two. So I'm looking at both of those tables. Table, table one here is where I got the one half, and table two is where I got the 80 calories per gram. Uh, for that matter, if you don't already know, uh, table two is also where I know what the melting temperature is of ice or H2O. Um, and, and so that one you probably did know because it's water, but if this had been a different material, like we were warming aluminum, you may not know, uh, obviously, what the melting temperature of aluminum is like. That's not a common one, but it's listed there in that table two. And then this third term uh, would be, if I can maybe squeeze it in on another line, it's still 400 grams because we still have all those H2O molecules. Now we have a liquid. So now the specific heat is one calorie per gram per each degree. And now we are going to warm it five degrees. So if I come back here, there's 400 times five is 2,000. Half of that is 1,000. So there would be 1,000 calories because grams would cancel and degrees Celsius would cancel. Uh, this here, uh, let's see, a four and an eight make a 32. And that'd be 32,000 calories. And then now we're back to the five and the four. That's a 20 with two zeros. And so that's 2,000. All right, so 32,000 and two make 34, 35. So ultimately the answer is 35,000 calories. And I am out of ink in that pen. Let's switch. And that help? Oh yeah, definitely. Good, 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 good. Hey, well, uh, feel free to hang, hang on here. If you have any more, uh, throw it in the chat room. That's usually my comments to students as they log in so that I can keep track of who was here first. Obviously you were here first when I saw you or at least, well, I don't know how the, the login exactly worked there anyways. But I wanted to do yours and I'll, and I'll come, I'll pop back to you because some of these 102 ones can take a long time. So if, you're, uh, if, you, got, if you got some more questions, let me just do a 102 and I'll pop back to you, okay? I mean, uh, yeah, one, let me do a 122 and then uh, pop back towards. Sure, your... sure. And I'm gonna go independently work on some, some of these ones myself just to see if I can, okay. what I can do with them. Okay. Okay, all right, Good. thank you. All right, so let me switch back to the Zoom on this one. Let me turn on the chat here. All right, so I think I remember seeing Andrew. Yeah, could you do, all right. Yeah, and this would be, let me write it down. Uh, chapter 31, number 28. All right, I will be glad to. All right, good to see you guys working. You guys already did a, an exam and then plugged right in. You guys are serious students, you make me proud. <laughs> uh, sadly, I've been trying to get a chance to get to your tests and I really, I haven't even got a chance to start grading them. Uh, worked a lot with the 102 people on uh, Tuesday afternoon and Wednesday and then their exam on Thursday and well, today I'll be Zooming, so let's tomorrow. Usually takes me two to three days, so Sunday night, Monday night, should have it uh, graded. That's my hope. Then I get to the 102 people. Are you going to post a video solution? or? Um... Oh, yeah, yeah, and I should do that, too, because I, I think that's real helpful. Yeah, that'd um, be great. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Um, all right. And then, uh, yeah, that would have been nice to do. I could have squeezed that in yesterday. I should have done that. I don't think I would have time. Well, actually, I probably would have time this evening. That's what I probably would have done. Once, uh, once I'm done working with you guys in uh, this club, I'm uh, going to be part of it at 4 o'clock. And whenever that's done, I guess I'm 5 o'clock. Who knows? All right. Uh, so, chapter 31 here. So let me switch over to your guys' homework uh, questions. This must be you guys, okay. Scroll down. Oh yeah, okay, I had to scroll pretty far here. I when we're getting pretty far into the semester. All right, and then, oh good, let me get my pen out here because I have a feeling a lot of these are visuals. I might need to go and uh, change from my camera to the white board here and right on your screen i got that all set up because i know that this is gonna at least this topic can be very visual with the with the flux uh, anyways let me scroll down to figure out 28 oh yeah 28 okay you and then it is it's yes yeah, it says uses lenses law um yeah you know what and i'm i'm gonna here let me grab my in for my uh, screen. Let me then do a stop share of my camera. Let me jump over to the textbook. And whoops, too far. Where is chapter 31? Okay, chapter. 31 and number 28. I want to grab that picture. Yeah, oh, let me make it a little bigger. Let me go 100%. Okay. Ooh, that wasn't good. All right, where it is? Okay, and it's got these four figures here. Uses Lennon's law to answer the following questions. Consider the direction of the current. A, what is the direction in the induced current in the resistor in the figure? Oh, I see. There's uh oh, okay, that makes more sense. All right, so let me let me copy this. Uh, around the four, might as well do all four of them, I think. Might be the way to go. Good. And uh, then let me go back to the zoom and do a share. Where is the zoom? Okay, good. Let me share whiteboard here. All right, and oh, I've done this before to myself. Apologize. Let me share again because there's two whiteboards, and I like the Microsoft whiteboard a little bit better. Okay, probably just because I'm used to it. All right, so okay, so there's the uh, whiteboard. Uh, looks like we got uh, some stuff I want to get off the screen or maybe I'll just uh, leave it there. Let me scroll down the whiteboard. <laughs> There's the end of this. Looks like we did a lot of work last week. I haven't cleared it off. Nah. And this this might be good right there. Let me do a paste and let me make it A little bigger. There we go. Uh, maybe I'll yeah, look at. Okay, so let's look at A here uh, first because it says here uh, use a lenses law to answer the following questions concerning the direction of the induced current. And A, what is the direction of the induced, induced current in the resistor R? In the figure A, 
when the bar magnet is moving to the left. All right, now let me switch to a green color here because I think for this to work, You want to keep in mind that there is a magnetic field coming from this bar magnet. And I won't draw the whole thing. I'll just draw a couple of them. And most importantly, the ones that go right through that uh, coil of wire, you know, you know, I'll call it a, a, a solenoid. And so the way I've drawn it, I've drawn, I guess you might say, one, two, three, four, five lines of flux going through there. And if you pull it away, there will now be less. Okay. So, Let's see, maybe a different color. If I were to pull it away, the magnet would be now here. And the first couple of lines of flux may arc away before it even gets to the coil. Uh, the one down the center still is going. But the point here is you need to realize that it is getting reduced. There is less flux from the bar magnet. And Lenz's law, let me repeat this, Lenz's law wants to keep the flux the same. I'll say it again, it's a change that you want to focus on. Do not focus on the flux, focus on the change in the flux. All right. So this is a decrease in flux because the bar magnet is moving. So switching colors to red, the current wants to make up for that loss. So let me draw five red lines on here. No, excuse me, we have one, so we lost four. So let me draw four red lines. So those red lines are gonna be the direction of the flux that are created because of the current in the looping wire, okay? And so I'll say it again, Lenz's law opposes the change. Before I moved the magnet, I had five. Now when I pulled the magnet away, I have one. The original five is supposed to be my green flux. When I pull it away, that's the blue flux. See how I lost? four of them. So the current wants to make that up and make the flux go so that there are four of them represented in the red from left to right. Okay, so now we finish this by saying, well, what direction would the current then be? Let's see if I have a different color here. I think I have an orange. But in order to get the current in the correct direction, that the flux would be in the direction of the red, that's left to right, I need to use right-hand rule number two. So going back a chapter to chapter 30, and I don't have my camera on here, but I, uh, maybe I'll put it in front of me here. <laughs> but I, uh, this is what I'm going to, to do with the, with the camera, although I guess, see to get it going in the wait, right direction on the screen i think that would be the right direction on the on the screen i'm going to do this okay at least my thumb is pointing in that direction all right so i'm going to take my right hand and i i can switch back to my camera if that'll be more help but i'm going to write it with orange and say all right so the current would have to be coming over the top and so the I would be the direction of the current. And this last bit right here coming over the top, down of the wire, through the resistor, going back up, 
That's the question. And so it is from the left to the right. And so there's the, the answer to A. What is the direction of the deuce current in the resistor from the left to the right? So if that made any sense, let me go back to 100%, right about there. And let's look at the second one. And I wonder if it might be easier if I just pasted another figure. Give me something to draw on here. Maybe I'll make this one pretty big so I don't have to make the whiteboard big. Then that makes the lines fat. Okay, so let's look at B. And it's going to be the same logic. So B says, uh, what direction is the current induced in the resistor immediately after the switch S in figure B is closed? Okay, so let's talk about the flux before we do anything. So usually I like to start with green and I'll go in the same order. Here's my, my green. Hey, how come I made my... Picture smaller when I did that. Okay, let me bring the picture back in this place. Okay, so right now I'm just going to put the word no. Hmm. Well, maybe that's, maybe I do have to. When I touch it, it got small. Okay. But what I want to get across here is no flux. Right now, there is no flux anywhere. Uh, there's no magnets around. There's no current around. There is no magnetic flux. So I'm focusing my attention on the, uh, you know, where the resistor is, the right hand side here and say, well, there is no flux. However, as soon as I turn on the current, and it looks like in the last one I did orange for current, so I'll do that. I'm gonna put a little arrowhead in orange and say, okay, as soon as I close it, there is now going to be some current in there. And then that current, so we gotta go back to chapter 30, and say, all right, that current is going to make some flux. Well, which way? Well, here's where right-hand rule number two comes into play. Uh, this is, again, more about chapter 30 so far. But uh, if I kind of picture the current looping over the top, and so, well, my, Screen is reversed of my, so I shouldn't hold my right hand in the picture. Maybe that'll make things worse. But I'm trying to get you to see that if you hold and curl your fingers in the direction of the orange, in the direction of the current, then you're going to get some flux going through the solenoid this way. Okay. Now, remember Lenz's law. Lenz's law says that the induced flux opposes the change. Remember, there was nothing to begin with. Now, all of a sudden, we close the switch, and there is flux going from the right to the left. So I'm going to draw some blue arrows to represent the the flux in what I often call the secondary. Because Lenz's law, I'll say it again, wants to oppose the change. Remember, there was no flux. 
So if you make some green flux going from the right to the left, Lenz's law says the induced current will be in such a direction that it will oppose the change. And so in this case, it needs to cancel it off. And so that's why I'm drawing the blue lines. The blue lines then cancel off the, the green lines. So the blue lines are going from the left to the right. Now, to do that, the current would have to be, and so I'll go back to my, my orange, and let's see, to get current to go, I need to get my right hand rule and say, I guess the current would have to go, and so I'll do orange in my secondary, down around the bottom, and back up the top. And so in the resistor, it would go from back to front. Yay. All right. Uh, let me keep going. Uh, let's look at C. All right, so C, let me read the question. Uh, what is the direction of the induced current? What is the direction of the induced current in R when the current I in figure C decreases rapidly to zero? Now, I don't know if rapidly is important because if there's a decrease, rapidly is a, a number that if when we calculate using Faraday's law, we, we, we need to know how rapidly to calculate it. But as far as the direction and Lenz's law, uh, it's just a decrease. All right, so let me begin by saying, all right, we already have a current, which means there already is some flux. And I'll put the initial flux in green. Uh, again, I'm gonna use my right hand here, right hand rule number two, to answer this question. To, well, but even to start the question, what is the direction of the original flux? Okay, so the original flux would be going into the screen. So I'll put a series of green X's here. And I guess technically there would be flux going into the screen over here and out of the screen over here. But that's not relevant for this problem. We want to know how it changes in the loop that has our resistor in it. So I drew eight little X's for representing the magnetic flux that is already there. Okay, so I'll say it yet again. Lenz's law opposes the change. It does not oppose the flux. Don't, don't mix the two. It opposes the change, not the flux. All right, so it opposes the change. So think of this as it already has eight going in. It wants to remain there. And here's where it's important. The current is being turned down. So being turned down would mean you would have less flux. So let me turn on the eraser here and let me erase a green one and a second green one. I'll just do two green ones, okay? because that's what would happen when you turn down the current. The field would be weaker, and the flux is a combination of the strength of the field and, of course, the area and, of course, the angle. Well, area and angle, we didn't change. What we did is we reduced the strength of the field by reducing the current. So I went from eight X's down to six X's. Now, now here's the key. It says that it opposes the change. So we had eight going in. Now it goes down to six. So that means it wants to create, so I'll put in blue, two more going in. So the induced ones are in the blue. 
and they want to go in. I know that because we opposed the change. I'll say it again. We had eight before. We turned down the current. That lowered it to six. So the induced current makes up for it to get it back to eight. It opposes the change. All right. So that would tell me in the secondary, which is the flux represented by the blue, go in. All right. So I'm going to do my right-hand rule again, number two. And I'm going to point my thumb in and then say, okay, well, if my thumb points in, I need a current then that goes around the secondary in what I guess would be a clockwise direction. And then that would, of course, be from left to right. And so there's C, left to right. Okay, so again, always opposes the change. All right, now D looks a little harder. I don't see much here in this picture. Let me read the question. A copper bar is moving to the right while its axis is maintained in a direction that is perpendicular to the magnetic field as shown. Now, I'm not sure I see a magnetic field as shown. Am I missing something here? Oh, 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 I'm sorry. What is the direction of the magnetic field? Ah, I'm sorry. All right, now, now I understand the question. Okay, so a copper bar is moved to the right while its axis maintained in the direction perpendicular to a magnetic field as shown in the figure. If the top of the bar becomes positive relative to the bottom, what is the direction of the magnetic field? Okay, so the reason they didn't give us, they just say there is a magnetic field. Okay. Now, what they are saying, though, by saying the bar is positive, is if you did have a loop here, this would be the direction of the current. Uh, now, in this case, you don't really get a current because we don't have a circuit. We just get the top part positive and negative. It would be like having a battery by itself. If it, if it helps with your thinking, you could say, imagine, <laughs> and within a very good rectangle, but imagine this is on and contacting a metal loop, or maybe I should say a metal horseshoe on its side. And if, if it was then, then you really would now get current. The current would go up and the current would go through here and then down and then around. And so the current would go in a clockwise direction if, you, if there was actually a loop here. So there is not a loop, so we don't really have current, but that's the way it wants to go. So in this case, we're kind of doing the problem in reverse we know the direction of the induced current, okay? Now, they say the magnetic field is perpendicular here. And so maybe I will put an option in green. The magnetic field could be going inward. Or, uh, how about in blue, the magnetic field could be coming outward. We don't really know, but here's where I'm going to use Lenz's law. I'm going to say this, that if this bar magnet was closing or moving, as, as they show with the velocity from left to right, and if the flux was going in, so if the flux was in the, with the green, that would make less of them going in. 
So the induced current, let me put that in red, would have to be in to make up for the loss. Because remember, here it is, here's the key. Lenz's law is to pose any change. So if you move inward, let's say the bar magnet, let me actually, I'll erase the red one for a second. Let's say the bar magnet actually moved to here, or not bar magnet, the bar. That would have passed two of the green ones, and now you would have less green ones going in. So the current in the secondary would create a flux in such a way to make them go in, to make up for those losses. So I'm going to make two red ones there. And now if I do the right hand rule, putting my thumb in the direction of those red X's, I would then make the current go in the clockwise direction as indicated. Ah, so that must be it. The field must be going in. Now, just to kind of check that out, maybe I will erase, my movement and think about it in terms of the blue ones. Uh, the blue ones are coming out. Let's just say the magnetic field was coming out. Okay, so now the bar magnet moves and I'll just, not magnet, sorry, but the bar moves, I'll put it here. That means we would have less blue ones coming out. So the current would have to be set up in order to make flux coming out because it opposes a change. We, we lost two coming out, so we will have to gain two coming out. So if they're coming out, I guess I would use my right hand and point it out here, and that would make the current go in a counterclockwise direction. That would be the opposite. That's not what's happening. Okay, so my first, my first uh, guess was, was, was correct. The, the induced flux is not uh, coming out, uh, which then tells me the original flux would not be these blue ones. The original flux would be the green ones, because as I close up, I gotta come out. Uh, I mean, we gotta go in. I gotta make up for that by going in, and that would be a clockwise direction. Ah. Hope I got those right. Maybe I should check the answers then too. All right, so number, let's see, chapter 31. Uh, what was this, number 28? Scroll down, scroll down. And the first one says, to the right, I think that's what I got. Yeah, I think I remember saying left to right. Uh, out of the plane, yeah, I think I said, I said from back to forward, good. Uh, the third one was to the right, good. And this one says the magnetic field must be into the paper. Yay, okay, got lucky, got them all right. All right, good. All right, so let me switch back here to the Zoom and see if you guys have a question. Hope that helped, uh, Andrew. All right. So yeah, I helped. I was pretty confused on how to do the like uh, induced current direction at first, but part A really helped me understand it. Well, good. And, oh, I thought it would. And then by the time you do all four of them, you start to get the hang of it. I must say, uh, one of the challenges is to remember that you have to do all the right hand rules. You have to know these, you know, the direction of the flux. And then the other two things I think are hard are keeping track of which is what I like to call the primary flux, and which is the induced flux or secondary flux. Because you, you know, and that's why I thought my drawing here with a, a different color between the primary and the secondary might help. Because it's like, whoa. And it and not to scare you, but it sometimes can get worse later on in a couple of chapters because we'll have both electric and magnetic flux, primary. And then we'll have both electric and magnetic flux secondary. So we've got two different magnetic fields and two different electric fields and keeping them straight can be a challenge. Yeah, that sounds pretty complicated, but hopefully <laughs> I'll learn it all by 
I'll learn the magnetic stuff by then, and then the electric stuff will just come easier. Okay. Uh, and then I'll and I'll say one more thing, especially for anybody later on catching that video. Is you'll notice I kept emphasizing that Lenz's law opposes the change. Sometimes and many times, students interpret that as Lenz's law opposes the flux, and that's not what it says. It opposes the change in the flux. So this last one was a good example where we already had flux going in and we opposed the change. So that means we made more going in. We, we, we didn't want it to come out. We didn't want to oppose the flux. We wanted to oppose the change. So that's, that's, that's tough to digest. All right, cool. So then we're off to Gina's problem. Hey, good morning to you too, Gina. Uh, would you be able to discuss number 25? Yes, I can. Does the audio sound? Oh, that's probably what you asked way back at 10, 12. Okay, so audio still doing okay? All yeah, right. you sound great. All right. Oh, I sound great. I should be a DJ. <laughs> Well, it's good because you have a you're you're on the panel today. I I saw you. Um, yeah. You said you're going to be speaking at the club, which is yeah, yeah, cool. yeah, yeah. Do you have, yeah. Uh, do you have a, something ready to talk about? No, no, they didn't give me anything to talk about. Oh, I, I guess I should think about that and shoot them off. I uh, it, it it was just a panel, I think, of questions, and they um, I I really um, are you part of the? I forget what the S I S I A M um, uh, stands for. Uh, I think the M is mathematics, science, and industrially applied mathematics. I think that's what it is. Society, yeah. Society, society. Okay. Society I'm not a part. I I usually have like work conflicts that prevent me from. Oh yeah, you might um, check out right at, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, one year, and obviously it wouldn't have been this summer, <laughs> the pandemic, uh, but uh, so it must have been last summer. Uh, yeah, the whole club and then uh, more than one carful, but I took my carful. Uh, we went down to uh, oh, the open house at JPL, and that was really a blast. And that was really educational. It was, that, that was great. Probably when they probably would have done it again this this year if it wasn't for the pandemic and everything, but that one was that was a that was a hit. So, but uh, so the, inform the information oh, go I got from them was was uh, you know was more of a panel and a question and answer session of what uh, you know whatever whatever it is they wanted to to ask. So I don't have any prepared remarks here. So. But uh, that's maybe, cool. maybe. so it's raising awareness of, of STEM, essentially. Uh, yeah, but you know, I, I really like their question because you know, there, there are some things we do very, very well in higher ed, and some things we do poorly. <laughs> and I think one of the things we do poorly at is connecting the students to what would you be doing on a job site in, or in a real world? Uh, it's academia can be a little detached from the real world. So maybe that's, yeah, thanks for making me think about this. That, that's probably what I should uh, point out. And they probably already know that, but any of the listening audience might need to hear that. It, they, they wanted to know our, our, our input working in industry and there's a reason higher ed is kind of uh, both jokingly and affectionately referred to as the ivory tower because we just things are just a little different uh, there and uh, we do a great job of educating students so it's not that they can't take their education but you know it's you know, when you're running a business and trying to turn a profit and there's timelines, it just, it's just a little different. So it should get that some thought. How, you know, how is it different? Why is it different? 
I've heard yeah. it can it can take um, six months before a new employee actually adds value to the company they're hired at. Yeah, uh, I, I did say that. I would say there's a break in time. Six months maybe seems a little long, but I I, I can see that. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It just. Uh, Yeah, so that you know, if 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 I, if if I was uh, in charge of uh, revamping education, I would I, I would I, I would give that some serious thought to um, what making that connections a little better, and uh, and Cal Poly Pomona, I mean not Pomona, uh, Central Obispo has done a really good job of always keeping that in their, their mind, and. Uh, and uh, require things like senior projects and club participation, and, you know, activities like that nature. All right, anyway, that's one of the reasons why they're so highly ranked. Yeah, yeah well, and it is. And so their, their students come out, and, and I doubt if their students have that six month uh, period that you're talking about, you know, and maybe there's more like two months. Cool. Yeah, I, I still say some of the best things I, you know, not, not not the best. I mean, obviously, studying the STEM and learning the knowledge and the, that, like Lenz's Law, but uh, I was in, for about a year and a half part of a, a robotics club. That was useful. We, we actually tried to build our own robot. So we did a lot of electronics. We did the soldering. We, we actually did all this Lenz's Law and induction, and and, and that, that, that was extremely helpful, and, to, and some other things that... Uh, programming competition and some other things that I had I did which really you know put the the knowledge that you learned in the book work then to the test and that's where that transition is and then and, and, you know I, and I'm trying to say it in a way that I don't know if education could could change should change completely because you got to get that book knowledge first or in addition to uh, and then the application knowledge. Yeah, I feel like all I've done is like solve problems, but it's like if you if you read a lot of books on playing poker, that doesn't mean that you can sit down at the table <laughs> and have right. have any success. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. So yeah. So book work or head work is is a little different. And there's you know there's another uh, twenty four inches connection between your head and your hands, and so that's that's the connection really. Yeah, you know, you, you talk about all this magnetic flux, but you know, to see it in action is just a little different. You know, you draw, draw these pictures, but then you, you're in, you're, you know, you're in the lab and you grab a solenoid and you, you solder it on, and it, it's just, it, yeah, it's not like drawing a couple lines and say, okay, this uh, this solenoid is now connected to a battery and a switch. <laughs> I had to solder yeah. it. Especially being online has um, yeah. put the hands-on learning even more. Yes. Yep, 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 yep. And that's right. That's right. And that's where the labs are supposed to come into. And and, and to be quite honest, it, it's it's more. That's where uh, the upper division should really start picking up on it a little more than what we do here at community college. So that's you know that's kind of the the next level. You know when you guys transfer. Uh, okay. Well, finding to your problem here, uh, number uh, twenty five here. All right. So let's. Me find your guys is oh yeah this uh, Faraday disk uh, generator um, yeah it's a low voltage high current generator consists of a uh, rotating conductor I need to think this one through disk uh, with one stationary brush sliding on an electrical contact. Uh, on an axis and another point on the circumference is shown in the figure. The magnetic field is perpendicular to the plane of the disk. Assuming the field is 0.9 Teslas and the angular speed is 3200 RPMs, the radius of the disk is 0.4. Find the EMF generated between the uh, brushes when and to produce a large magnetic field homopolar generator uh, can output several megawatts such generators are useful for example in purifying metals ah, 
the voltage is applied, the output terminal. Okay. All right. I think I skipped over the question. Let me backtrack here. So what was the question? Find the EMF generated. Okay. So I'm going to switch back from my whiteboard to the camera for this one. And I'm going to draw once the screen pops up here. It didn't focus. Okay, good. Um, I'm going to draw kind of looking face down on it. So here's the disk. So there's my, my circle. And uh, the flux, uh, let's see, I'll pretend I'm standing on the right looking over. Like, uh, oh, I had that little stick figure on the, <laughs> the first exam that I accidentally sent to you had a little stick figure guy on it looking over. And I really messed up that. Oh, I didn't want to do X's. I wanted to say I was standing on the right. Okay. So, bet I freaked you out when you got the copy of the test, huh? Oh, I never got it. I just, um, Oh, Someone I bet said you freaked out when it. you said everybody else, everybody else got it, but you. <laughs> yeah, well, online learning has had its challenges. Yeah. Technology is yeah. one of them. That was a faux pas on my part. I, uh, I, I put it in the wrong folder. I, I yeah, just totally screwed up. <laughs> and you know, and the, actually, and the reason I did that, I was trying to do something different because last time. I put it in my on my Google Drive, and for most people, it worked fine. But sadly, um, some people really struggled, um, and I think I figured it out later that they had their uh, synchronous on that. And so when they would click on something, even though they had logged into their uh, school email, like I I said. As soon as they clicked on that, the new browser window that popped up put them back in their personal email and then blocked them, and they were having all kinds of troubles. So, anyway, but, but uh, there was there was a bunch of anyway. So I go, well, I go. This time I won't do this. This time I'll actually put it in Canvas. And then uh, there were these folders, and I and I thought the folder I was putting in it was the one that was kept it private until. <laughs> It unlocked, but it, that's not what happened. <laughs> it was locked for me, so I don't know what other people had access to. Uh, okay. So it, it worked, but it worked for me, but not for other sections, yeah. I guess. Yeah, 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 I, I, yeah. It, it must have been other sections. I, I just messed up. Anyways, okay, but uh, let, let me get to your main one. Okay, so uh, I wanted to draw this picture. So here is this uh, disc, I'll, I'll make it in red. So if you're standing on the right, kind of looking in, it's spinning around, and so there's the, the omega, and the flux is coming at you. And maybe the way to think about this problem is to say, let me take just a piece, kind of like a slice of pizza, if you will, and look at that for a moment so let me not look at the, the whole whole disk that, that, that's it's a little bit harder you'll you'll see why um, but let's look at one slice by itself so that's why i wanted to draw that picture and then i wanted to then repeat that with just the pizza sliced here okay because what's going to happen here, and this is where Faraday's law can get a little, little confusing, because as we move, maybe we'll say that there's a metal piece that sticks up, but I guess I want to be careful with that, because that's where Faraday's law becomes a little confusing. 
because we are, I'm, what I'm doing is increasing the area of a mathematical loop, not a real metal piece, not a slice. In, in other words, the induced EMF is equal to, and technically there's a negative, and then the number of turns, and then the change in the flux. And the magnetic flux is an integral. But this integral is a mathematical loop. Uh, I don't want to call it an Ampian loop, but the Ampian loop and the Gaussian surface were the same idea here. Maybe a Gaussian surface is the same thing. The Gaussian surface was not a real physical surface. It was a mathematical surface. And that's why I keep drawing these pictures. I'm trying to ultimately get you to see this, that what I want you to picture is maybe I had then this as my starting loop a little bit later. It now has increased to what I would call maybe a thin slice of pizza. And then a little bit later, a thick slice of pizza. And so this area is increasing. And I'm afraid if you think of it as a metal piece, you, you, would, you wouldn't see the area getting bigger. You would just see a thin piece of pizza just kind of rotating around. And that's what I'm trying to avoid. Because this is the mathematical loop. It starts here, and then it goes bigger, 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 bigger. So the magnitude of the um, induced voltage, and so I'll drop the negative and the number of loops would just be one. And so then this would be the derivative of the magnetic flux through this area that is growing. So I'll leave the derivative alone for just a second. And I will take a dot product. But the way they described it is that the magnetic field is then a constant. And not only is it a constant within this area, but it is a constant in time. And so I can take this B and not only pull it in front of the integral, because it doesn't change in space. Remember, this is an integral in space. But then we're asked to take a derivative with time. And so uh, one of the things I want to emphasize when I do Faraday's law is that there are two pieces of calculus here. Uh, one is an integral in space, and another one is a derivative of time. It's quite possible that you have something that's a constant in space but changes with time or the other way around changes with space but constant in time so when you start pulling things out and you say they're a constant you need to be a little careful by saying is it a constant of space or is it a constant of time and in this case the b field is a constant of both space and time i'm going to pull that all the way in in front now the angle, the same thing. The original picture had the flux coming out, and I didn't put a dA vector, but the dA is perpendicular to the surface. And we could debate whether coming out or going in, but since I'm calculating magnitude, it, it doesn't uh, matter. 
Uh, but I do want you to see then that would be zero degrees. And it would be de zero degrees everywhere in space, but it also remains that way in time. And so this cosine of zero would pull in front of the integral of space, and it would also pull in front of the derivative of time. And of course, cosine of zero is one. But to emphasize to you that I'm pulling it in front of the integral and the derivative, I wanted to do that. Okay. So what I'm left with here is just this integral of dA. And so you would you might say, well, that, that's the, the area of this piece of pizza, or whether it be a, a thin piece or a fat piece. So let me just put an angle theta here, angle theta, and say, okay, what is the area of a piece of pizza? Well, I guess for a circle, it's pi r, and should I use a capital R? What did they call the radius of the disk? Uh, I don't see a symbol in their picture. How about in the writing? All right. I'm just going to leave it as a lowercase r. All right. That's a full circle. And then if we take a fraction of it in terms of two pi, this would be the area. So then I'm asked to take the, the derivative here, okay? So the B I'll carry down. Uh, this cosine of zero is one. And then the area we just did, and we can even cancel a pi. And then we're asked to take the time derivative. Well, there's the one half. I can pull that out. Uh, the radius of the piece of pizza doesn't change. It just keeps getting bigger. And so I have this d theta dt. And that is how the angle increases as it rotates. That's the angular speed. Well, there's the b, there's the r squared, there's the omega, and there's the, the two. And so that should be the EMF. So now if I put in my numbers, I have 0.9, I believe, Teslas, and radius, current high voltage consisting point on the circumference by perpendicular radius 0.4. So 0.4 squared. Um, I'll put the two in here and they're going to make me go back to my physics 121 and my chapter 10 for my angular speed because they gave me an angular speed of 3200. And they gave it as revolutions per minute. But to make my units match, I better put two pi radians per revolution, so that now they're in radians, and then also one minute is 60 seconds. Okay, so finally, we can get my calculator. I'll do the angular speed here first. 3,200 revolutions per minute times a 2 times a pi, uh, then divided by 60. Okay, so there's the angular speed. And then so times 0.4 squared times a 0.9 and then divided by a 2. And so the EMF here is 24.1 volts. Okay. And I suppose we should give a check for this. This is number 25 and 24.1 volts. Good. Oh, good. And in the picture on the solutions, they did a good job too of, of showing a circle and a little 
kind of pizza pie shape there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Trying to remember, is that a sector or a segment? It must be a sector. Anyways, uh, I'll go with sector. And then they, they touch the electrodes. Hope that helped. It helps a lot. I didn't follow the theta over 2 pi um, that you put down under DA. Oh, uh, okay. So let me go back. Theta. Uh, uh, okay, yeah. So let me break this down a little bit. The, the first part, the integral is just A, and I think you got that. Um, but what I did is I needed to find the area not of the whole circle, but a fraction of it. So let me write it this way. A fraction of a whole circle. So pi r squared is the whole circle. And I want a fraction of it. Well, how much do I want? Well, it depends on that angle up here, theta. And you know that a full circle in the radians is 2 pi. So the fraction would be whatever angle I have divided by 2 pi. That's my fraction. So if I take that fraction and multiply by pi r squared, that tells me the area of my fraction of a circle. Oh, okay, I follow you now. Yeah. And in fact, you can see it if it was say a half circle. If it was a half circle, this, this theta would be pi, and that would cancel, and I have one half of pi r squared. Or if it was a quarter of a circle, this would be pi over two, and the pi's would cancel, and the two twos would go together to make one quarter of pi r squared. Cool, that makes sense. Fraction of a circle. Thanks. Um, I was going to ask, do you think um, the remaining one third of the class is the hardest material? Um, not, no. Um, okay. Because I do think that Well, I don't think it's easy. Let me, let me make that clear. <laughs> um, and I think some of the stuff we did at the beginning was real hard. Okay. Um, so I put it in that category, but we're about to go into some more circuit stuff. And there's where we apply our, our science. And so it, in some sense, has a pattern uh, like chapter 27 and 28, I thought it got a lot easier at that point because we had learned the science and then we did our circuits. And circuits tend to be a little bit easier, I think, anyways. Uh, I'm sure not everybody agrees with that statement. But I think circuits are a little bit easier uh, because you're applying what you've learned. And so you're not learning anything maybe new, but you're actually using it. And that because it's practical because it's and we're of course we're in a pandemic we're not really hands-on but i'm going to use that phrase anyways we're, we're hands-on uh that tends to make things a little bit easier uh and we're going to do the same thing however the circuits we're going to do are harder than the circuits we did in 27 and 28 so so do we have some hard stuff yes uh do we have some a little easier stuff i'll say yes to that because we're doing circuits but the circuits are harder than the circuits we did in chapter 28. So, yeah, because things are changing and we have magnetic fields and electric fields at the same time. So there, there was a problem on the, the past exam that was on YouTube. Oh yeah. I think it was number three that combined circuits with magnetism. Is that kind of like the way things are going to be? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, that's exactly it. So we're, we're learning Faraday's law here. And you'll see uh, next week, that's exactly where we'll start. We'll say, okay, now uh, what would happen if, you know, you had, well, I'll just draw it down here in the corner. You know, you had this, here's a battery, here's a switch, so V and S, and maybe kind of try to keep it simple here. 
here they register R. And I'll just make a simple circuit that probably looks like chapter 27 to you, where, okay, it's just Ohm's law, right? And we would say something like this in chapter 27, we would say, okay, well, the current would just be the voltage divided by the resistance as soon as the switch is closed. So before you close the switch, there would be no current. After you close the switch, you would just do Ohm's law and you would go V over R. Yeah, but that transition from closing the switch means we go from no current to some current. And as the current goes around, it makes a magnetic flux <laughs> that's gonna go in. And there wasn't any flux to begin with. So that means there's going to be an induced flux pushing the current backwards. And so we're gonna say, imagine there's a momentary battery of Faraday's law, an induced EMF opposing this current during this transition. And so there's a time frame for about a couple millionths, maybe a couple thousandths of a second where the current doesn't automatically go to this value. So a graph would look more like this, where if I plotted the current as a function of time, it would go with zero currents. And after a long period of time, it would be a solid current of just V over R. But during a couple of milliseconds, it has to transition and it's affected by not just the battery and the resistor, but also by Faraday's law. And so how does it transition? And we'll solve that and we'll see it's a, uh, an exponential uh, connection. And that, that, that's where it gets a little tricky because we got to do Faraday's law in there. Oh, wow. So it happens over a brief, a small period there. Yeah, so remember it only opposes the change. And so the change eventually tapers out. Cool. And then, is this kind of like PhD? Um, is it okay if I ask um, which discipline or which which um, area of physics you got it in? Oh, me? Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, my, uh, my PhD thesis was on uh, photonics. Uh, maybe lasers is an easy way to describe it. Wow. That's, that's so cool. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was, it was, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, and that's probably what I'll, uh, good, now you're making me thinking more, I probably should share that with the other group, because, uh, you know, I was so, so glad I, I, I went on, I uh, almost did not, you know, I was, uh, I uh, grew up kind of on the uh, poor side, didn't have much money, uh, was heavily in school debt, did not want to go to more schooling and get more, more debt, and uh, fortunately, my uh, advisor shared with me that in the STEM field, you usually don't take on more debt in graduate school because of all the opportunities there are for teaching classes or teaching labs or doing research in the lab. And, and, and sure enough, that's exactly it. So I went ahead and applied and, you know, and I was in graduate school for six years and Oh, it was so much better for you know, for a lot of reasons. You know, one of them was the only classes you you take in graduate school. So for six years, all I took were science classes. I didn't have to take all things I didn't enjoy. Everything I took, I enjoyed. It was just fantastic. And then my job was either teaching or doing research, and uh, I was paid for that. So I wasn't taking on more debt. And being in school, all my uh, school debts were deferred, you know, so I didn't have any, any payment or interest to have to worry about that till I finally graduated. And uh, yeah, no, I, so I had a, a, enough to live on. I mean, I was, certainly wasn't getting rich doing what I was doing, but I was getting <laughs> educated and enough to live on and really just having a fun time doing it. So it was like, okay. It would have been cool, a mistake. That worked out pretty well. Yeah, it would have been a total mistake if I if I hadn't gone on. It was just like I didn't, uh, you know, I, I kind of viewed it as more college and and, uh, and and not that that was so bad either. I just 
you know, after four or five years in college, I was, you know, just interested in science and I was tired of the uh, other classes that I felt like were just holding me back and holding me down. <laughs> yeah, totally. Has, <laughs> has math always kind of clicked for you? Yeah, and math math has always clicked uh, for me. That's that, that, that's one thing I uh, said. In fact, I uh, would have never really probably even pursued what I did hadn't. Uh, yeah, that's another interesting life story. Is when I went, uh, I was not a good uh, student in eighth grade or in middle in all of middle school, and I just wasn't focused on school at all. I mean, I. You know, one thing I wanted to do was to get out of school and ride my BMX bike, you know, and, uh, you know, so inevitably I would show up at school the next day and the teacher would say, did you do your homework? Oh, we had homework? <laughs> what? Um, maybe. Uh, and uh, so I never did any homework. And, uh, but I'll never forget then my, my freshman year, they stuck me in a uh, physical science course. And uh, it was a, a pretty advanced one, um, or you know, it, it, it was the top of whatever a ninth grade you know science class could be. And uh, I, I knew for sure I was in the wrong class. I go, oh no, this this is not for me. <laughs> this is the wrong class. And I uh, went in to see my counselor, and this is what, one of those things that was probably good. There was so much bureaucracy because I go, I want to see my counselor. I want to get transferred from this class and they'll say here you got to sign this form and you've got to wait until they get a chance they're so overwhelmed they're dealing with everybody's schedule okay i said you know none of my friends were in that class and uh we, we started doing a little chemistry and the periodic table and mixing stuff and i i got it i i totally forgot that i wanted to get out of the class totally and then i got a uh, a slip one day in class and had to go see my counselor. I go, I wonder what this is for. <laughs> counselor goes, oh, so you want to get out of this class? Because I think I've got another schedule here for you. And I was like, oh, no, wait, wait, I like this class. Wait, <laughs> I only wanted it out because none of my friends were there, but now I've made other friends. And it's a really fun class. <laughs> it was the slow paperwork that actually yeah. worked out in your favor for once. <laughs> it, it did, yeah. The slow paperwork really worked out. And so... And and then and then somebody somebody at the middle school. I'm sure it was the, the combination of the math teacher and the science teacher that, even though I didn't do my homework, uh, they must have made a recommendation that I should be in that that class. And they said, "Oh yeah, well." And I always go, well, I, and I should make it a little more clear. Uh, probably because you know I don't recall ever doing well in my science course, but I I, I might have. I always did really well in my math courses, but I never did the homework. So the teacher was always frustrated with me. Why don't you do homework? And I was like, well, I don't know. It seemed pretty easy. Why don't you just give me the test? <laughs> and so I'd get an A on all the tests. So they go, okay, you're good. <laughs> it's so, like the lazy genius phenomenon that you hear about sometimes. Uh, maybe, maybe. Oh, yeah. I wish I was a genius. But yeah, you so it was like that. But, just, uh, but 135 IQ, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. You know, one time I stumbled across a chart that had this was a few years ago, but it was a uh -huh. chart that had like IQs ranked by profession, and at yeah. the top were like math professors, physics professors. Yeah, it's yeah, it's it, it, it's true. It's it, I don't, I, uh, yeah, it, and, and it's a blessing and a curse, uh, because. You know, uh, well, this week is a good example. I just, I, I, I feel like I have never been able to vote for a politician that has a decent IQ. Oh, so right, it, yeah. Doesn't matter which side of the spectrum. It's just like, you know, you, you all just need to learn how to solve problems. Yeah, we, <laughs> a, we need a, uh, a politician who can listen to scientists. Well, the, well, yes, 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 yes. We did one who could listen at least, uh, but having a higher IQ would help also. <laughs> yeah, I can't believe how close this race is. It really surprises me that so many people in this country actually voted for Trump. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and again, 
they, again, this is probably just more me not being so much interested in the politics. I'm absolutely fascinated on how off the polls are and the science behind it. Because, what do you mean? Well, the polls did not show a close race. I mean, they showed Biden winning by 10 points. Oh, like in terms of the popular vote? Both the popular vote and the electoral vote. So I, I, I would put it this way. I think the, the, the loser right now of the election is actually the statisticians who do the polling. They were just wrong. They were, oh, no. they were way wrong. How does that happen? Uh, yeah, that's that's where people need to go back. Yeah, and look at the science. They're 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 doing they are doing something really wrong. And they did it. They did it in 2016. They they predicted Hillary Clinton would win, and they were wrong. And here they predicted Joe Biden would win by 10 points, and they're really wrong. Yeah. So. Uh, whereas most people probably are more interested in the politics. I've been reading a bunch of articles on the statistical data they've been using, and it's kind of fascinating just how wrong they are, and I hope they can do better next time. Like the forecasting's wrong? Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I thought, it'd be, I thought it'd be a landslide for sure for Biden. Yeah. But I was well, and you, and you, and I would assume you're saying that because you saw the polls. Um, I'm saying that just because maybe I visit maybe more liberal news sites, but I've, oh. I've heard nothing but negativity about him for four years. Yeah, well, okay, yeah, let's see. Okay, well, fair enough. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. When you, when you go on just your personal experience, yeah, yeah. Because you, as, right, especially in today's uh, uh, world where when you visit a website, they, they know what you like and then they keep feeding that same stuff to you. So you never get the other side of the coin. So. Yeah, that's something to consider. Yeah, so that's the, that's and and I and I don't have an answer for that because you know when you're talking about Snapchat or Facebook, you know they're not really in the news business. They're getting in you know readership, so that makes sense. Yeah, right. I I heard a they mentioned that on a podcast. I think it was Joe Rogan had a really good guest who was like ex Facebook or ex Google. He talked yeah. about how. They're all competing for your, um, keeping your attention. Yeah. And they yeah. have a very complex algorithm. Like, right. for example, one of the examples he uses is that when you scroll through your Facebook, you think it's like generated based on like, you know, recency of posts, but mm -hmm. really it's like created based on like what you're likely to click on. Right, 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 right. Which, right, which is, brings me back why your statisticians uh, need to, you know, keep that in mind, and uh, you 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 would hope that they could get a more uh, realistic uh, approach. So that's why I think the uh, loser in this election really is the uh, statisticians. I, I, they 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 blew it. I don't know exactly how yet, uh, but I'm waiting to uh, read more about their. Uh, statistical methods because they, they 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 missed it is it possible they were deliberately giving biased results of course anything's possible but i i don't think so i mean uh, again i'm going from my gut i think i think there are a number of well let me rephrase that it, it goes both ways i mean obviously um there are some news organizations that they want to influence you and they, you know, it, it seems like they don't care. Yeah. They, they, you know, and, and I, I think it goes both ways. It's it, on the right, it's Fox news and on the left it's CNN. But I think the major ones like NBC and stuff are, are, are truly trying to get a real take on it, but they're, I think they're influenced by their own personal bias and they missed it. That would be my guess. I remember reading that like 90% of news companies are owned by the same company. Oh, okay. Well, then that- yeah, I, I have a distrust in the news, but- 
yeah, that will that would certainly perpetuate the same thing. Yeah, because once, well, yeah, yeah, good point. But it, there's some other statistics. There's some other statistic too that the news is, um, you know, tends to be uh, news newscaster and that disciplines tend to be more uh, liberal oriented. So I can see how they would uh, not knowingly, uh, but their their numbers would be biased in a particular pattern. I know it's like you can take the same data set and show two completely different analyses based on the same data. You, well, you 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 can, and of course that's that right right, and that's why so you want to be careful. The argument you want to make first, and then give me the data second. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So you you can you can fudge it. I, yes, I think it was uh, who, uh, Mark Twain. I believe is the one who said there's three kind of lies in this world. Statistics, I'm sorry, lies, damn lies, and statistics. <laughs> <laughs> Advertisers have been pulling that trick for many years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So certainly you could, but presumably a, a non-biased, honest science statistician would do as much as he or she could to keep it honest. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, and I think they and they, and they just missed it. So I, I really think they tried and they missed it. And that's that's what I find fascinating more than anything else. Yeah. I was actually looking at the, you know, the BLS, the Bureau of Labor Statistics. They show oh, okay. jobs that are expected to grow. Oh yeah. The statistician, interestingly, was one of the top ten, I think, hmm. for being needed in the coming near future. Yeah, yeah, that, well, you know, of course, I, yeah, because I put that a little bit into uh, data scientists, and I, that's probably was what I could in the top. Yeah, that makes sense. I know, like, um, the health industry, like hospitals, have, like, a lot of data that they need um, consultants to parse. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, yeah, so, yeah, 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 so, you know, if, you, if anybody, uh, any, any, yeah, anyone who shows interest in, in data science, it's like, oh, yeah, go for it, man, you'll be, You'll be high demand and well paid, and be glad you did it. Yeah, I actually read in the um, Independent. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there was an article okay. from about SPCC starting a data science. I don't know if it was a club or like a. a, a oh couple yeah. Program, I think it was. A couple I, of yeah, I saw. I saw that too. I. Uh, I, I don't remember either what it was. Uh, I think it was classes. I think it, I think they were going that way because um, um I saw maybe about six months ago to a year, uh, the, the private school there in Westmont, uh, Westmont um, in, in there in Santa Barbara, uh, had started a, a, a new major of uh, data science. Yeah, I was about to say, I expect that to be like a new major mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. popping up in college. Yeah. Right, right. All right. Oh, Gina, well, I'm gonna, I'll pop out here now. It looks like uh, our other question from Scott, he, he split. Maybe he'll be back later, but uh, we'll take a 45-minute break and come back at 12.30, okay? Oh, okay. Yeah, sounds good. All right. Okay. See you soon. Thanks. Bye.